Heaven, Purgatory, Hell, Places of Eternal Destination. To which place will you go for all eternity? The Roman Catholic Church teaches these places are real as one passes beyond the veil of this earthly existence. Our guest today, Brian Hoyland, died. He met Jesus face to face. Jesus gave him three messages. Those messages are for us as well. Welcome to a special Upon This Rock television ministry presentation. I'm Jan Marie Halpin, your host, and our topic is Heaven, Purgatory, and Hell, your final destination. Our guest today is Brian Hoylan. Brian is an Army veteran, and he had a near-death experience. He served his country all over the world and suffered some injuries due to his service. He holds a master's degree in counseling psychology and currently works as a clinical therapist. Today, he will share his near-death experience, the messages that Jesus gave him, and how it changed his walk with Christ. Welcome to the program, Brian. Hi, thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Take us back to that fateful day in 2017 when you died. Yeah, it was, it was a shocking day for me. I, I started going into the heart failure. I was in end-stage chronic heart failure for several months already. Mm -hmm. But this one was a lot different. I, I felt like I was going to die. There was really nothing I could do. I, everything I was trying wasn't working. Got taken into the emergency room. Um, and there, I, they were trying to stabilize me for about seven hours. And once they felt like they, they had me well enough that they could move me up to the ICU room, that's where they were going to take me. And this whole time, I was just oppressed by fear. Uh, it, the pain was really intense, but the fear was so oppressive. It, it felt like I was being chewed up by it. I, I couldn't pray well. I kept thinking about all the things that I have done, and I couldn't come up with anything good. I, I couldn't think of anything that was worthy of, of going to heaven. And I kept thinking about all the things that I had done that were, were worthy of going to hell. And I, I just couldn't pray. It was as if I, I was being stunted in my, in my ability to pray. And so I got brought up to the, to the ICU room and they transferred me from the ER bed to the ICU bed. And that's when it really got, got bad. All my organs were shutting down. Um, including my lungs, I, so my respiratory system was starting to fail. I felt like my whole body was just under attack. I, my blood wasn't flowing because my heart wasn't pumping properly. I couldn't breathe, so it felt like I was suffocating. And all that fear was just sitting on top of me. But when they moved me to the bed, I, the only place I could see, because they brought in a whole bunch of medical professionals, um, you know, they called a code blue, and the only spot that I could see was at my feet, and that was facing to the wall, and there was a crucifix on the wall. And I felt this inclination, like I should, I should offer that up, because that was really my, my salvation is, is through the cross. And so I, I started to pray, and I asked Mary to help me, because I just couldn't do it myself. I was so afraid of everything that was, that was happening. And as soon as I asked for Mary to help offer up her son's sacrifice, that's when I felt this surge of confidence. And it, it just overwhelmed me with like a comforting love that, that I could feel. I could feel the love of Jesus and Mary there the whole time. It wasn't like I, I didn't feel that, but the fear now was gone. I, nothing else had changed. The pain was still there. I, I was still hurting and I knew I was going to die. There was nothing else I could do. How did you know you were going to die? I just knew it was coming. I, I could feel it. It was like being in the jaws of, of some kind of a ravenous beast. And I just knew that my heart was giving out and there was nothing else that was going to happen that, that could save me. I didn't, I didn't feel like the doctors had any opportunity. There was nothing that, and the doctors, they were panicked. It was, it was really like being you know, on those, those nature shows where you see animals like wolves ravishly be east, eating beasts. That's kind of what I felt like. They were pulling my arms in different directions. They had me strapped down. Every once in a while I would get a, a shock to try to bring my heart rate down. But nothing was working. And yet that confidence, it felt so good. And I just, 
it, it was hard to keep my eyes open. It, it was hard to talk. They were kept asking me questions, and I didn't want to answer anymore. I just wanted to pray now that I could and just be be done with whatever the the doctors had had in store for me. You knew you were close to death, so that's serious. And you wanted to make sure you were right with God. What was your relationship with Jesus at that time? You know, my, my relationship was up and down. I always thought it was good. You know, I, I always thought that I did the right things and I was, you know, living the right life. But it wasn't, it wasn't as if I put God first in everything. It was really that I had put myself first in, in just about everything that I had done. And that was hitting me, hitting me really right in the face the whole time. I, I knew that that was what was keeping me from having confidence. And I, I just felt like when I had, had asked for that intercession, that's when I, I knew that I had, had some help that was, that was more than just coming from me, not, not anything selfish on my part. And it was just like an emptying of myself. And that's when I, I closed my eyes and just, I was so, told the Lord I was ready to die and I was ready to come be with him. And, I felt this intense pain come over my body and a shake and a pop as my soul exited my, my body. And then I was in a dark tunnel. And in this dark tunnel, I was looking into a, a void, like a big empty nothingness. And in that, it, it's, I could feel like I was encompassed with love and there was peace all around me. All, all the noise and chaos of the hospital room was now silent. So everything was just beautifully silent. But at, at the same time, that dark void had, had this, this call. It's kind of alluring, trying to, to tell me that everything was great, everything was comfortable, to be content and just be there in the nothing. And, you know, I, I had this increased rush of intelligence. Like every memory that I had, Every thought, every idea, everything that I learned, everything was there for me. It was as if I had access to everything that I had ever experienced in life. But with that, I, I knew that the, the love wasn't coming from that dark void. So there was something menacing about it. There was something kind of sinister about that, that dark void trying to compel me to go into it. Do you feel that was the devil or demons? I think it was, but it it because it felt compelling. It wasn't it wasn't coming from the love. It was totally separated. And when I was there, I certainly felt that way. And you know, I I had all those thoughts, like I said, but it was this one thought that really predominated, and it was that this couldn't be it. And it wasn't just that I was saying this can't be it, but it was that. I didn't want any kind of existence, even with the love and peace, if I didn't have Jesus. And as soon as I said that, I realized that I was seeing this light behind me. In fact, at this point, I, I realized I could see in 360 degrees. And my vision was so magnified that I could see the, the, dark, the dark void. I could see the light behind me. You know, and if I was looking at you, I could see the front of you. I could see the back of you. I could see the cameraman, the front and back of him. I could see everything that that was going on without any kind of limitations all at the same time. So I, that was really impressive because I felt I needed to turn to look at the light, which I really didn't need to because as soon as I actually did turn, I could see the dark void still behind me. It didn't ever go out of my view. But what I could feel about my body as I was doing this is that I, I was just a spirit. I didn't have a physical body. But I didn't feel like I was oozing all over the place. I felt contained by something, something nurturing and loving. I didn't see Mary, but I felt like that she was holding me as I was, as I was standing That's there. That's beautiful. It was wonderful. It, it felt the same as when I, when I had prayed and asked her for her intercession. Were you very devoted to her during your yeah, life? Yeah, I, I really was. But I, after I got my master's degree, I really kind of fell away from things. I didn't pray my rosary as often. When I, when I first converted to Catholicism, I, I found the rosary to be a wonderful tool, something that really brought me closer to the Lord. And, you know, I had to really overcome a lot of Protestant thinking because, you know, Mary was not something that, that we often talked about when I was growing up. So I did feel very strongly connected to her, but I had gotten away because I got so caught up in, in my career and my life. And, but I could feel that, that her love as I was, I was, I was standing there looking at this light, and <clears throat> the light was far away. It seemed like it was just an eternity away, but it was so brilliant, so magnificent, 
And I remember that I said, I want to be with that light. And there was something that was impelling me towards the light. It was like just something beautiful that was calling me to that, not trying to trick me or try to force me. I felt like it was my own internal desire, but it was an impelling feeling that, that I wanted to be with that light. And as soon as I had said that, I was there. I was right with the light. So it was like, God was respecting your free will. Yes, the whole time. This is a theme that I found throughout my, my experience there is that I would ask for something and then it would be granted to me. And it was not that, that I was ever forced into anything. So I didn't feel like I had to be in submission, but I wanted to be. I, I could feel my soul was genuflecting this whole time. But it was, <clears throat> it was impressive because I didn't feel any kind of like G-force or acceleration as I was moving. You know, I was there instantly, but I, I also didn't feel wind on my face. So I, it was really impressive that I could move that quickly and yet still remember every step I took. So do you think you were moving by your thoughts? I, everything was intellectual there. It, I, I didn't have a physical body, so I didn't feel like I was taking steps, but I did feel like I had actually seen every step that I had taken. So everything there was intellectual. Even my, my communication, when I was talking, there was no, nothing audible. I didn't have any kind of verbal communication, but it was just these thoughts that I was having. So telepathic? Very much, yeah. And, and it, was, it was so connected to that love. And, and so when I'm standing before the light, I'm looking in, in every direction, all at the same time as I'm looking at the light. And it was cool because I was looking at, at you know, this, this far in the light as my vision was growing. It was almost like traveling in a vehicle. And you travel in a vehicle or in a, a plane, you know, you can see that, that you're traveling. You can watch your vision as it's going. But that's how it was for me. I was looking in all these directions, and it was endless. There was no end to this light. It was just Did you so know endless. that it was God? I did. And as soon as I recognized that it was God, that like, I actually had that thought about it, that's when I heard the voice of God saying, you can come in. So, of course, I went right into the light. So whose voice was it? God the Father or Jesus? I, I think it was the Father because it was different. It, it was a different impression that I had than, than when I did meet Jesus later on. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it was, you know, I didn't see God's face or I didn't see a, a physical form of him. So I don't know if the light was just his love and his radiance, but mm -hmm. it, it was definitely God interacting with me. How did that make you feel? Were you frightened or did you feel peaceful? No, I wasn't frightened. I, I would have been had he been angry, but he had been softened. And it felt like it was when I had asked Mary for her intercession that everything was softened, that I, that I actually had his attention, that I didn't feel like he was ignoring me or... Or that you were getting ready to have a final judgment. Yeah, it, it really was this, was... this was something more intimate and beautiful that I was feeling, but I, I would have been terrified had, had he been angry with me. Mm -hmm. um, there, was, there was something, though, that was freeing about it. And as I was in the light, I, I felt this rush of love and peace, but the love was like a river. It was like rushing into me. Mm. And when I say that, I mean, I, w I was like drinking out of a straw. You know how you drink out of a straw and there's liquid down in the cup mm. and it goes into the straw and then into your mouth mm. and never leaves the straw empty, but it always goes. It will, imagine if you had an endless cup and that's what this love felt like. Wow. It, was, it was totally endless. So I was constantly going to be filled for all of eternity with this love constantly going through me. And it was never depleted. So there was, there was just this endless amount of love that was rushing into me. And while I was doing that, it was like shaving off all the hurt and resentment and just every bit of sorrow that I had experienced in life. And I was realizing how wonderful that his love was. It was mending those broken places in me. And so... As I'm seeing this, I, I realized that my thoughts were, were like they are as for humans. You know, we have all these memories and thoughts and ideas. We don't recall them all at the same time. We might not think of something for many years. But that's not how God's thought was. God's thought was just one thought. And everything that was created, everything in history, every thought or idea that me and you have or memory that we have was all contained in that thought. And it was the word of God. It was Jesus. That's his thought. And when I realized that, I said, I, I want to see Jesus. And as soon as I said that, the, the light opened up. And there was this vast amount of beings in this room. 
And this room was so much larger than, than that dark void. You could have fit several dark voids inside this room. And the beings, I've never seen a trillion, but I would imagine that, you know, that could be a number I could label on it. There, there was just so many beings that I couldn't even grasp how many there were, but I could see, again, the front and back of everyone. And in the middle of this, this group of beings, there was Jesus. I could see that he was so much more resplendent. He was the, the same magnificent as the light. That, that's how dazzling, beautifully lit up he was. You just knew it was him. Oh, absolutely. My, like I said, my intellect was so much higher than it is now. And it was wonderful to be able to see him. And I knew it was him. But everything that I, I had was geared towards Jesus. Even from going from the dark void coming in, it seemed like a beeline right towards Jesus. And who were the other entities? Were they angelic or human? I, I think a mixture of both. Um, it was... It was as if they went off into the periphery, though. When I, what I was seeing with them at first was just dazzling light, you know, really beautiful light, but like a, almost like a reflection off of what they were seeing with Jesus. So I, I think that's what it was. I'm not really sure, but it seemed as if that's what they were doing is reflecting his light. And it was varying degrees. Not everybody had the same amount of light, but it was it was as if that's what they were doing. And so I, I knew that it was Jesus was the source of that love, that river of love that was flowing into me. And so as I'm looking at him, I said, Jesus, I want to see your face. And again, he answered it, and he, he let me see his face. And as it came together, all the other beings, I could see their physical forms, but everything kind of went off into the periphery because I was so fixated on Jesus. So the only thing that I can really remember is seeing Jesus. I, I, everything else is kind of a blur or just distant memory to me, but Jesus was structured into my mind. It was emblazoned there. And so as his face had come together, I was seeing his features and seeing what he looked like, but I couldn't lay it down in my memory. And what happened was, it's like, kind of like, you know, those, those old books where you, you flip the pages, you had a little cartoon on it and it barely moves on the next page. But as you flip it fast, it looks like it's really moving. That's kind of how it was with Jesus' face, except what my brain was remembering was this dazzling light. It was just flooding into my, into my mind. And it was palpable. I mean, I could feel it. It was where the peace was emanating from. And it was as if the love was emanating from his heart. And I could feel that connection with him as if he, everything about me was starting to transform and to allow him to be inside of me and to just take possession of me. And then I started to do my life review. And all my thoughts were already there, but I was going through everything that I had done, and I was being taught what, what was wrong about them. And everything that I had done was really traced back to my pride. Everything that, that I had done wrong was usually because I wanted something different, or I didn't want something that I think I didn't deserve, or just everything was based on a, a selfishness and twisted. And I started to realize that Nothing good really came from me except for what God had given me. And all this was happening at the same time. And the whole time he's staring at me and smiling. I'm curious, was he making the life review happen or were you making it happen? You know, it felt like I was making it happen. And it, it was as if I was going through these things that were, were troubling. I, I, I think he was helping me to learn from them. And he was healing me from the, the damage that I had done to myself. And really it was that, that feeling of, of emptying myself of that pride, of, that, of those sins, and just holding on to him. So he was teaching you a lesson through the life Absolutely. of you. I, I, the Absolutely. Whole, the whole time I was there, it seems like you know, when I tell the story, it seems like it's happening in this, this continuum, but it was, it was almost as if everything was happening all at once. And... So that it gets kind of confusing to explain it, but except in, in the, the more linear continuum. But what, what was really impressive was how he was just emanating his love to me. Despite all the things that I had done, it was as if he had forgiven me for them. But as I was doing this, everything that I was seeing, I was seeing how it hurt him in his passion, how, how he had to suffer for my sins. 
Now I realized that he did suffer for everybody, but I could see what mine did done to him. How did that make you feel? It was tough. That was a really difficult thing to to see that, but it made me despise those sins. It made me want to just totally detach from everything and and allow him to have full control of me. It, there, I'm not a submissive person. I don't submit to to anybody in my life. I've just never been that way, and yet here I was so submissive. And it wasn't as if I lost who I was. He didn't take that away from me. I, I still felt as if I was me, but a better me. And and it was his love that was really making that that me better. And so while it did <clears throat> it did bother me that I had done all these things, the lesson that I was learning was helping me to learn how to get out of my own way. And so I remembered a prayer that I had prayed when I was six years old. And, you know, around six years old, I guess. My great grandmother had died, and everybody in my family, all the people I loved, were sad and they were crying. And I remembered I just didn't want to impose any kind of feeling like that on people while I was alive, by my death particularly. So I had prayed about it for a long time that night, and I remembered feeling like that prayer was answered. And as I was thinking about that, it was almost as if I was asking Jesus, hey, did this really happen? And he said that he had remembered it and that he did grant that prayer and that I could still have it. But he asked me, why would I want to go back? And it wasn't simply, you know, why would you want to not be here in heaven? Which it did contain that, but it was more than just that. It was him asking me, what would be my purpose for going back? He was giving you a choice. Yeah, he was definitely giving me a choice. So you could have stayed in heaven if you wanted to? Well, I don't know if I would have stayed in heaven or had to go to, to purgatory. Mm -hmm. But it was certainly not going to go the other way back to the to that dark void. Mm -hmm. So I felt that you know he's so he's so loving. He's not going to do anything that would would jeopardize me. I also kind of feel like my my salvation is secured as long as I follow what he tells he had told me to do. But I I knew that he loved me so much that he wouldn't let me just arbitrarily risk everything by going back. Yet he asked you the question. Do you want to go back? Yes, he still asked it, though. And What did you say? Well, I started to think, and again, this is where I, I really think that purgatory would have to be something in, in store for me because it went to my pride again. Like I started to think, well, my family needs me. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Families do need, do need each other. But it was, it was something that he showed me that he loved them more than I loved them, which is hard for me to even believe is as I sit here you know I love my family so much but he really does love them more than I do so that wasn't that wasn't just the the reason to go back because he still was going to take care of them so I thought you know what about other people all the good I could do and that wasn't it either and I I realized that the reason I wanted to go back was to do more for him to glorify him more to, to show him more love because of the love that I was feeling, not even for a reward in heaven. It wasn't that I wanted to go back because I thought I could gain something better in heaven. I wanted to go back because of that love that I felt from him. It, it overwhelmed me. It was so powerful that I would have done anything for it. And that's when I realized that I had to just die to myself. I had to get rid of that pride and and just let him be the, the whole light of my life. He was allowing you, Brian, to come to that conclusion. Yes, absolutely. So it was, it was wonderful. I, I, I felt so connected to him at this point. And during that, that whole time, he's teaching me, but the three things that he taught me was that I had to pray more. And when he showed me the, the model for praying, it, it validated something that I knew, and I think most Catholics do know, is that the best model for prayer is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her whole life was a prayer. Everything that she did, every action that she did, every thought she had, everything about her was focused on Jesus. That's the only thing she cared about. And if we live our lives that way, I, I guaranteed that I was, I was going to be in connection with the Lord. Our Lord Jesus gave you three messages. Pray more, suffer joyfully, and share his love. So did he say it was just for you personally? No, no. Or did you share it with everyone? He, he was talking to me personally, but he, it certainly was something that this is how all people can validate their purpose because 
there is nothing in life that doesn't come from him. So if we live our lives for him, then that is our purpose, no matter what comes our way. And, and that leads into the second thing that he taught me is to suffer joyfully. And this is something that, that is really hard for a lot of people to grasp. It certainly was hard for me as well. But to suffer is something that seems contrary to, to our human nature. You know, we, we want to get out from underneath of suffering. We want to try to avoid it at all costs. If we're, if we're running a marathon and our leg starts to hurt, we're going to take, take it aside and try to stretch ourselves out or try to loosen up, do something to try to make it feel better. But what, what it was about was that what comes our way isn't always something that we can, we can control. I certainly couldn't control my heart failure. I couldn't control my death. Those things were coming anyway. And as I was watching the, the whole experience, I saw how Jesus had to carry his cross. And we all have crosses, very different ones, but we have crosses. And didn't Jesus say, take up your cross and follow me? So that is a part of Christianity. Absolutely. And he did die on the cross for our sins. And you know what's interesting is that's what he was teaching me. He was teaching me that very lesson with his own passion. Is he didn't need to die. He, he died for us. It was, it was a free gift to us. And my going back was to give myself to him freely. And to just accept him as, as fully my Lord and Savior. Not just when I felt that it was convenient or, you know, at the end of my life, say, oh, yeah, you know, by the way, Jesus, I really want to follow you. This was something more profound. And to really get out of my own way and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what God wants. Whatever he puts me in, whatever position I find myself in, I'm just going to try to do as much as I can for him to honor him. And that's, that's what suffering joyfully is is to just accept the things that we, we have. It doesn't mean we don't try to you know, use our rationale and, and you know, try to avoid drowning if we're going to drown or something along those lines. You know, but we, we've, got to be, we've got to be willing to accept a lot of things that we would, would normally not be willing to take, particularly swallowing my pride and allowing other people to make a choice and not always wanting my way. And for me, that's certainly a, a big suffering. Especially when you saw how in your life review, how some things you had done had hurt other people and had a ripple effect. A big ripple effect. Talk about that. It was, it was really impressive to see how vast that connection is between all of us. And you know, the one thing that I do really is going to affect that other person. And then who knows where they go with it. And I did see how that that had that ripple effect, particularly not standing up for somebody when I should. You know, little things that you often just totally disregard. Uh, you know, being mean when you, you didn't need to be and could have, could have avoided it just because I thought, well, somebody shouldn't treat me that way. But I didn't, re didn't have any kind of regard for that person and what they might have been experiencing at the time. And You can see when you're there how a person might treat you kind of in a grumpy manner but they really had something else more serious going on in their life. It wasn't about you. It was about what was happening to them. And I just added pain to their life. And the Lord showed you that, right? He showed me all that. And that's, that's where it was my, it kept going back to my pride is that I would be feeling wounded by this person when they weren't even intending to do it. They were wounded themselves. And I added something to it just because of my pride. So the suffering joyfully was really something of just getting out of my own way to really denying myself and following him, to pick up that cross. If, if it felt like somebody was you know, hurting me, it, I can let that go. I don't have to take that with me. And, and the pain is gone for me anyway, but it also doesn't add pain to that other person. That's a very important lesson because what you're saying is that Jesus was showing you that everybody has their cross, everyone has their suffering. But to have that empathy, to have that compassion, and to step back for a moment and say, what would Jesus do? Right, right. And that's what led me into the, the third thing was to share his love. And that's really the, the emphasis of the whole reason for me to come back was to, to share that love that he has been giving me. And that's the way I get to hold on to his love. I, I, don't, I don't feel that, that I can gain that kind of love without giving myself freely to him. And often that comes in the form of other people. Love one another as I have loved you. Yeah, and 
and it really has a strong, strong connection to him because we are so connected. You know, he loves every single one of us. So if I'm going to share his love, and that's really what he wanted me to do, he wanted me to share his love. This is the way to do it is to, to sometimes sacrifice my own desires and needs for somebody else and to tell them about him, to not be afraid to share his love, to share who he is. It's, it's something that I think is often really hard for people to do because they, they feel like the world will, will judge them. And, you know, I kind of felt like that too, particularly in my profession. It's, it's not really okay to talk about Christianity. You can talk about just about any other faith or idea, but Christianity for some reason really draws a negative connotation with professionals in my field. And, and that's, that's something that I'm not afraid of any longer because there really is no other love than, than comes from Jesus. Amen. So would you say Jesus gave you the gift to overcome human respect? Yes, that's absolutely the, the probably the biggest part of my, my pride was how I appeared to other people. And I, I don't know that I really care that much anymore. I, I still have to check myself. I still have to catch myself in it because it's, it's a really uh, pervasive illness to have pride. And so it, it tries to sneak up on me. If I find myself getting irritable, I realize, well, something's probably triggering my pride and I have to go in and figure that out. And often the irritability will go away. But what I do is I, I look at that inner peace. Once it gets disturbed, once I start to feel that di disturbing sensation in my soul, that's when I know I'm starting to drift off a little bit and I just start praying. And you know, I, I really do try to live my life as a life of prayer. I, I, I want to serve other people. I want to be a kind person all the time, just so that whoever I come in contact with has something positive that they are able to feel from God's love. That's beautiful. Did Jesus give you any specific thoughts or ways that he wanted you to show his love? He didn't say anything specific, but he did want me to, to, to show it at all times to all people. And particularly the most disadvantaged, you know, people who, who often need, need that love. And it can come from a lot of different, different sources. But, you know, when I, when I had gotten all of those messages, when, it, when all that sunk in, that's when he told me, it was almost as if he, he handed me my coat and said, here's the door. He said, now it's time to go back. And it wasn't in a, in a rough manner or, or disregard, like, hey, get out of here. It was... It was more of like that confidence, like you can do this. And I really felt like he was on my side, that he's, I knew he was going to be with me every step of my, my rest of my life for however long I get. He told me that he was going to give me a new heart. And I didn't realize that he actually was going to give me a, a new one than the one I already had. So I had a heart transplant. But I thought he was going to miraculously heal my heart and, and turn it into a, you know, a better, better version of it. He ended up taking it, but what he did is, is he did give me a new heart. It's, it's a heart that's in my soul that just wants to serve him and not myself anymore. And so as I'm, I'm starting to leave, the, the, vi the vision of, of heaven of that that open, that big, huge room now was closed off and I was in the light. And as I came through the light, I could see my tunnel. But at the end of my tunnel was no longer that dark void. It was the hospital room. And I was looking at it from the view as if I was laying in the bed. So I could see right behind my head, kind of looking out through my eyes. And I could see what was happening in the, in the hospital room. I could see that they had this big green machine on me. It was doing chest compressions and, you know, it was I had ended up getting broken ribs from it. You know, all these things I was able to see as I was coming back. I saw how they had me hooked up to oxygen, some things on my head. And, and the doctors were really concerned. It looked as if, you know, maybe that they were, were even thinking about calling it soon. But I snapped back into my body. And as soon as I did, I spontaneously revived it. My body tried to go up as much as I could, but, you know, I was hooked up to a lot of things. And I instantly asked the doctor, did I just die? Because, you know, from a psychology geek, I, I really had never believed in near-death experiences. So this was something new to me. And yet I wanted to have that medical confirmation that I actually died and didn't have an out-of-body experience. And 
the doctor had to come closer to, to be able to hear what, it, what I was trying to say. And so I asked him again and he said, yeah, you just died. So there you go. A medical confirmation that you were dead. For 10 minutes, right? For 10 minutes. It was incredible. And, you know, I, I didn't have that fear. That fear didn't come back. It, it was as if that fear was still present. It was outside the door, though. It was just distant from me. I, I didn't feel that oppressive fear anymore. The pain was more intense. It, I felt that very strongly, but it didn't affect me. It, it was as if I still felt like Jesus was there and he was on my side. So he gave you the grace to endure the suffering. To absolutely endure it. It's, it's almost as if it really is a joy to me. It was, it was as if I realized that everything that I endure can lead to my salvation if I choose to allow him to help me through it. And if that's what I have to do to go to heaven, I bring it on. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to have the Lord there with you. And I've never felt closer to him than when I've been needing him the most. It's, it's usually when I, I drift away when things are going really well and things are, are really positive in my life. And I start to pat myself on the back and give myself a lot of credit. And I, I realized I didn't want to fall back into that trap. So he, he's been blessing me with a lot of different, different graces, but that grace to be able to endure suffering is probably the greatest one. Brian. Getting back to your life review, was that something that other people could see as well? Yeah, everybody could see it. And I could see everything that had happened too. So I didn't have anything limited to me. Nothing was hidden from me. Everything was exposed. But I was reviewing my life. I wasn't really reviewing everybody else's. Everybody else's was kind of in the, the periphery for me. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember like anything about you or anyone else. I just remembered all the things that I did, but everybody was seeing what I did. Did you feel embarrassed that other people were seeing your sins? <laughs> At first I did, I, <clears throat> but I felt more shame for what I had done. It was more internal than, than even the embarrassment of other people. And it was because there was so much support and love. Everybody there had, had their own sins that they were, they were all sorry for. Um, people, People were supporting me. It, there was love. It wasn't. It wasn't. Total, they, nobody was trying to shame me, mm -hmm. but I did feel shame, and yet that shame was getting shaved off along with those other resentments and angers and anything else that I had had in my life. But it was that peace coming from Jesus' face, you know, that love coming from His heart that was was removing that shame, and that was the lowering of my pride. It was Him taking and teaching me how to, to, to live differently and that what I had done was based on my own sinfulness and that, that I was now sorry for it. And he was helping me to, to move past that shame and, and more into remorse for my sins and away from that, that guilt. And that was really healing. It's, it was something that really healed my soul. So coming back into your body your resolution would be to avoid those faults and sins you saw yeah, in your life review. At, at all costs. I, you know, sometimes I, 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 I'll go to confession simply just because I felt irritated while I was driving to work. And, you know, it's, it's because I recognize that that just leads me down the path to where I'm going to keep falling into that, that pride. Pride is pervasive. It's, it's a tricky thing because it's always part of, of who we are to want to focus on our point of view. I mean, how else do we live, get through life if we don't have some direction? But it's, it's surrendering the outcome. It's surrendering the, the need to control how things happen. So if somebody cuts me off, I don't have to get angry about it. Usually that person's not thinking about me anyway. So it's, I don't have to personalize mm -hmm. that action. And that's something very different. That's something that, that I normally would have been very upset that somebody, you know, how dare they have the, the audacity to cut me off. So how do you handle it now? Well, I pray if I start to get that feeling because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I am human, so I still have, my, my body still does, does war against me. But I, I really just offer it up to God. I offer that sacrifice and say, you know what, I'm going to let this humiliation. I, matter of fact, I, I ended up uh, having a guy who cut me off and, he started yelling at me at a, at a stoplight because apparently I had gone, you know, I did go through a red light. There was, they didn't see anybody, so I'll be the first one to admit that I did do it, though. Mm -hmm. But he was really upset about it. And I, so I rolled my window down. I told him I didn't want to wreck your day. I, 
didn't didn't see you and didn't cut him off. He was driving too fast. But I just kept telling him that I didn't try to wreck his day. And, you know, it was humiliating because he was yelling all kinds of things at me. Mm -hmm. But he kept softening. And I could see how how just my interaction with him softened him. And every time I just kept apologizing for my part in it. Not what he did, but I didn't accuse him. I just kept apologizing for my part. And he kept softening to the point where he apologized for what he had done. Wow. And as we were leaving the, you know, the green light start happens and he's like, I wish everybody would just handle things like this. I said, so do I. You know, and we both felt good. So I was able to help in that situation to restore what I had caused for a bad day. You know, and, and for me, it felt really good because it validated that I don't have to be the one to, to always fight for my way. And that's something that only could have come from God because it certainly didn't come from my nine nature. Brian, the love that you shared was really the love that you experienced from Jesus. And that was transferred to that man. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that, that we don't understand love. You know, we talk about love. I, I love my children. Everybody loves their children and other people in their lives. And, you know, we even love activities, but we don't understand love when it comes to what God is. And He is love. He is every essence of it. We, we get like a little sliver of it. That's what we understand. We really are basically babies when it comes to understanding the magnitude of His love. But His love will overcome everything. And it overcame me, it overcame my pride. Everything that I was experiencing as I was doing my life review was overwhelmed by his love. I could feel his love just permeating into my soul. And that's what I showed to that man. I, I felt that connection to Jesus. I felt like I was getting out of my way and that I was letting him take control. And by him doing that, I had this wonderful experience with the stranger you know, that, that was really angry at me. And I, I was able to keep control of my anger and not let it rise up because I simply surrendered to God. And I let his love conquer it all because his love is stronger than anything else. That certainly was a grace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. This program is also about what the Catholic Church teaches about heaven, purgatory, and hell. I'm not sure, but Brian, did you see the state of your soul when you were before the Lord? I... I I'm not sure if I know exactly what you mean. I, I don't think that I saw where my, I was going to be determined to go. I, I definitely saw my sinfulness, and I saw it in its full magnitude. Um, I didn't see anything about me, though. I didn't see like how much I was reflecting God's light. I didn't see my body in, in any way. Um, but I did see my sins fully laid out before him, and... That was, that was very humbling. It, it was to the point where if I think I would, was to experience that without having him there, it might have killed me. It was, it was that, that traumatic. It was terrible to see what I had done to him and how it affected him. So you didn't have a sense that you would go straight to heaven had you not returned? No, I didn't have that, that sense. I, I, I felt the love. I felt secure. I felt very very happy. I mean, I was seeing Jesus. I mean, I, there was nothing that I could have stayed in a, in a sewer system for all of eternity just because of that love that I was getting. Mm -hmm. So I, that to me, I was, I was totally content, but I knew that, that I still had something gross about me that had to be cleaned, mm -hmm. that I didn't want to, to be with him without that gone. I, I wanted to have, have myself to be fully ready to be with him. So there was something that was that was still not, not, not fully, purified. Not purified. And I'm going to read what the Catholic Church teaching is according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church on Purgatory. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the consuls of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. 
As for certain lesser faults, we must believe that, before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. He who is truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor in the age to come. From this sentence, we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age, but certain others in the age to come. This teaching is also based on the practice of prayer for the dead, already mentioned in sacred scripture. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them. Above all, in the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that thus purified they may attain the beatific vision of God. The Church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. So at this point in your life, Brian, you were not perfectly purified. No. So we can conclude that more than likely you have gone to purgatory. That's what I thought. And we know there are many saints who have experienced interaction with the souls in purgatory. St. Faustina was a Polish Roman Catholic nun and mystic, and she was given the Chapel of Divine Mercy, which can also be used as a suffrage to help the holy souls. So what our Lord Jesus Christ, when he appeared in many apparitions to St. Faustina, he said he desires that the chapel be prayed, especially for people who are dying. And I'm going to quote directly from the eighth day of the Novena to the Divine Mercy. This is what our Lord Jesus himself said, and I quote, Today... Bring to me the souls who are in the prison of purgatory and immerse them in the abyss of my mercy. Let the torrents of my blood cool down their scorching flames. All these souls are greatly loved by me. They are making retribution to my justice. It is in your power to bring them relief. Draw all the indulgences from the treasury of my church and offer them on their behalf. Oh, if you only knew the torments they suffer, you would continually offer for them the alms of the Spirit and pay off their debt to my justice. Brian, we see that there are flames and suffering in this real place called purgatory. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to say the prayer and do an act of spiritual mercy for them now. Ready? Excellent. Most merciful Jesus, you yourself have said that you desire mercy. So I bring into the abode of your most compassionate heart the souls in purgatory, souls who are very dear to you, and yet who must make retribution to your justice. May the streams of blood and water which gush forth from your heart put out the flames of purgatory, that there too the power of your mercy may be celebrated. Eternal Father, turn your merciful gaze upon the souls suffering in purgatory who are enfolded in the most compassionate heart of Jesus. I beg you by the sorrowful passion of Jesus your Son and by all the bitterness with which his most sacred soul was flooded, manifest your mercy to the souls who are under your just scrutiny. Look upon them in no other way but through the wounds of Jesus, your dearly beloved Son, for we firmly believe that there is no limit to your goodness and compassion. Amen. That's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> it is beautiful. And we see the divine mercy image behind you, Brian. Our Lord gave us that beautiful image. It's for all of us, so that we can say, Jesus, I trust in you, not trust in ourselves. He wants us to share his love. What did that mean to you, Brian? It means exactly what you said. To, you know, really, it comes back to denying myself and allowing him to take possession of my soul. And when, when he does, love will come out of it, because all love emanates from him. Brian, since we're sharing about what the Catholic Church teaches, 
I want to go back to the teaching on heaven, and this is directly from the Catholic Catechism. Those who die in God's grace and friendship and are perfectly purified live forever with Christ. They are like God forever, for they see him as he is, face to face. By virtue of our apostolic authority, we define the following according to the general disposition of God, the souls of all the saints and other faithful who died after receiving Christ's holy baptism, provided they were not in need of purification when they died, or if they then did need or will need some purification when they have been purified after death already before they take up their bodies again and before the general judgment. And this since the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into heaven have been, are, and will be in heaven, in the heavenly kingdom and celestial paradise with Christ, joined to the company of the holy angels. Since the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ these souls have seen and do see the divine essence with an intuitive vision and even face to face without the mediation of any creature. This perfect life with the Most Holy Trinity, this communion of life and love with the Trinity, with the Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the blessed is called heaven. Heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme definitive happiness. To live in heaven is to be with Christ. The elect live in Christ but they retain, or rather find, their true identity, their own name. For life is to be with Christ. Where Christ is, there is life. There is the kingdom. Brian, you didn't see God face to face in terms of the beatific vision, or you wouldn't be here. Right. That's the ultimate reward for all of us. Yeah to be able to gaze on his majesty for all eternity. What a profound thought. Yeah, I can't wait. What do you think heaven will be like when you go back the second time? Well, I honestly think I probably am going to have purgatory in store. I don't know that I can escape that, but I'm not worried about it. I'm, I'm, I'm all set on just serving God for what I have left in my life now. And just to show him love. I know that here on earth, it's, it's easy to be tempted and distracted, but the more that we do things here, it really does pay off there. It, it shows him love because here we have free will to do it, what we want to do, and to sacrifice that for him, that's the only gift I can give. That's the only thing that I can give to him, and I want to give it all to him. There's a wonderful religious, Sister Josefa Menendez, and there's a book called the Way of Divine Love, which is about her. She was a nun and a mystic, and Sister Josepha had many encounters with the souls in purgatory, as well as hell. One of the things our Lord Jesus said to her was, unite your life to my life, my blood, and my works, so that they will have an infinite value. And Jesus also mentioned about the cross, and I'm going to quote from the Way of Divine Love, and what Jesus said to her, do you not know that I and the cross are inseparable? If you meet me, you meet the cross. And when you find the cross, it is I whom you have found. Whoever loves me loves the cross. And whoever loves the cross loves me. Only those who love the cross and embrace it willingly for love of me will possess eternal life. The path of virtue and of holiness 
is composed of abnegation and suffering. Whoever generously accepts the cross walks in true light, follows a straight and sure path, with no danger from steep inclines down which to slide, for there are none there. Brian, there were other mysteries that our Lord revealed to Sister Josepha Menendez that were beyond the pale of this life, and that was with the souls in purgatory. So I'm going to give a quote from The Way of Divine Love. Whilst well, day and night she bore the burdens of these terrible persecutions, God put her in touch with another abyss of woe, that of purgatory. Many souls came to solicit her suffrages and sacrifices in terms of very great humility. At first she was frightened, but by degrees she became accustomed to their confidences. She listened to them, asked them their names, encouraged them, and very humbly recommended herself to their intercession. The lessons they inculcated are worth remembering. One of them came to announce her deliverance and said, The important thing is not entrance into religion, but entrance into the next world. If religious souls but realize the heavy price to be paid for concessions to the body. And another, while asking for prayers, My exile is at an end, and I am going to my eternal home. A priest soul said to her, How great is the mercy of God when he deigns to make use of the sufferings of other souls to repair our infidelities. What a degree of glory I might have acquired had my life been different. What do you think about that? That's suffering joyfully. I mean, that's, it, it's amazing to, to hear the, these things validated by so many saints that you know, I was able to experience something along those lines. Jesus told me how to suffer joyfully, and really it comes down to picking up our cross and following him to deny ourselves. And it's beautiful to hear, hear these other saints that are, that are saying these things. I, it just warms my heart. Right next to the Divine Mercy image, we have Saint Padre Pio on our lovely set. And he was like a living crucifix. He had the stigmata. He was a Franciscan priest who for 50 years suffered the bleeding wound marks of Jesus Christ. That's a living example of suffering joyfully in the lives of the saints, right? Absolutely. I want to give the definition now. We want to cover all three bases. It's not pleasant to talk about, but there is a third place where people can go, and that's called hell. Let me read what it says from the Catholic Catechism. We cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love him. But we cannot love God if we sin gravely against him, against our neighbor, or against ourselves. Quote, He who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And that quote is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. Our Lord warns us that we shall be separated from him if we fail to meet the serious needs of the poor and the little ones who are his brethren. To die in mortal sin without repenting and accepting God's merciful love means remaining separated from him forever by our own free choice. This state of definitive self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed is called hell. Any thoughts about that? You know, it makes me think of that dark void. It, you know, it was trying to compel me to go into it, telling me that everything felt love and peace and that I could be just content with, without actually making that choice to turn and look at the light. And I don't know, I, I can only speculate because I didn't make that choice to go into the dark void, but I, I feel like it was trying to lure me in there to prevent me from making that act of 
choice to choose God. And I'm glad I chose God. I'm glad I chose to go to the light. I got to see beautiful Jesus and experience his love. But it makes me wonder how many people could be fooled into thinking that life just simply existing in, in a nothingness, feeling love and peace that can't be there in that dark void because it only came from Jesus. It only comes from God. And we know there are many saints who have experienced interaction with the souls in purgatory. And some of them we have on our beautiful set. St. Gertrude, who is behind me, she was given a prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ wants all of us to say, the relief of the holy souls in purgatory. Let's pray for the holy souls in purgatory. Would you lead us in that prayer, Brian? Eternal Father, Father I offer, offer you the most precious, precious blood of your divine, divine Son, Jesus. Jesus in union with the masses said throughout the world today, for all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, those sinners in the universal church, those within my own home and within my own family. Amen. Thank you, viewers, for joining us in saying that prayer. That's an act of mercy. Brian, do you feel there's anything that our Lord has put on your heart after your near-death experience that you want to share with our viewers, a takeaway, as it were? Yeah, the... the the fact that he taught me about the true purpose in life, it's not about our own selfish ambitions. It's about serving him, to make him the, the whole purpose of your life, to make him the, the source of everything that you do. And we can do that here. It's, it's hard with the distractions. We have the world, we have our flesh, we have the devil, we have things that are warring against us, but we can, we can give ourselves to him. We just have to actively have to choose to do that. And when we do, our lives will be richly, richly rewarded. Brian, thank you for being on the program today. It's been an insightful and an incredible experience. Thank you for sharing your testimony. I don't like to close a program without giving viewers an opportunity to open their hearts to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And after hearing of Brian's testimony, I'm sure you don't want to end this program without opening your heart to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So please interiorize this prayer and make it your own. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again on the third day. I ask you to forgive me for all my sins and I truly repent of all my sins. I receive your precious blood for your forgiveness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I surrender everything to you and I give it all to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Ryan, would you please lead our viewers in a prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we want to offer you the glory and praise for your great name and for the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you fill our eyes with your light so we can see as you see, and our hearts with your love so we can love as you love. Everything good that we have comes from you, and we give it all back because your love and your grace is enough for us. Amen. Amen. And for those of you who already know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I just want to encourage you to continue to live a life sold out for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and continue to live this message that is to pray more, suffer joyfully, and most of all, share His love. Thank you for joining us, and may our Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you with His joy, His peace, and His love. Thank you for watching Upon This Rock Television Ministry YouTube channel. I'm Jan Marie Halpin, producer and host. I'd like to thank you for all your prayerful support, and yet we do need financial contributions to keep producing new programs. So if you enjoy the program, please prayerfully consider giving a contribution to our tax-deductible 501c nonprofit ministry. Thank you, and may our Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you.